professor bhatnaka can we start please go ahead thank you good evening to one and all present here i hope all of you are keeping safe and doing good in this unprecedented times i ketan agarwal on behalf of seminar committee welcome you all to the valedictory ceremony of two day national seminar on emerging issues in law and justice in the perspective of globalization sponsored by department of higher education government of uttar pradesh the national seminar had been conducted over a span of two days with a diverse range of issues and perspective being discussed under the ages of esteemed panelists from legal fraternity this seminar had been an attempt to understand law and justice prevailing in the ever expanding and globalizing world that we live in i thank all the guests and the participants for gracing the event and sharing your valuable knowledge among us we would like to welcome our honorable vice chancellor sir professor dr subhir k bhatnakar without whose blessings and gratitude this event would not have been possible through this platform we would also like to welcome and extend our warm gratitude to our chief guest professor k v s sharma who is vice chancellor of national law university aurangabad previously sir was the professor of law at nalsar university of law hyderabad plus he was holding positions of consumer law chair at ministry of consumer affairs new delhi and head center for consumer and competition law at nalsar university of law hyderabad he had also received the best teachers award from state government of telangana presently he is a member of stamp committee at nizam institute of medical science hyderabad thank you sir for taking out time of your busy schedule and gracing us with your eminent present it is an honor to host you sir we would also like to take this golden opportunity to welcome our guest of honor dr nuzat praveen khan dr khan is currently working as a professor and dean at school of law bennett university she has she has more than 30 years of academic experience in new delhi she has authored dozens of books on conflicting and contemporary legal issues like women and child related laws women and the law child and the law etc her phd on the topic air pollution problems of its legal control with special reference to ncity of delhi was awarded publication granted by indian council for social science research ministry of human resource development professor khan has published more than 50 research papers in prestigious journals covering diverse areas of law she is also member of governing bodies academic councils and executive councils of various leading universities of india we welcome you ma'am and we are glad to be able to host you now i would like to ask our chairperson dr prem kumar gautam sir to give his insights over to you sir thank you ketan good evening one and all respected professor subir k bhatnagar honorable vice chancellor dr ram manohar lohia national university lucknow our chief guest of the valedictory session respected professor k v s sharma honorable vice chancellor maharashtra national law university aurangabad our guest of the honor respected professor nuzhar praveen khan dean of school of law bennett university greater noida respected dr v v salakchi head of the department department of legal studies dr ram manohar lohia national law university lucknow distinguished faculty members eminent speakers respected chairs and co-chairs of the technical session paper presenters participants and dear students i warmly welcome you all in this valedictory session of the two days virtual national seminar on emerging issues in law and justice in the perspective of globalization i would like to convey i i would like to convey my heartfelt gratitude to professor k v s sharma and professor uh, nusrat praveen khan for accepting our inv invitation i want to share with you all present here that during the presentation in technical sessions i had found that the researchers and the chairs were so much concerned about the topic and contributed a lot through their discussions and deliberations the topic emerging issues in law and just in the perspective of globalization is very relevant topic in today's context when government on one side trying to protect the people from the vicious pandemic and they are forced to implement the restrictive measures to stop the spread of this corona virus which sometime not going well and people raise the issue of infringement of their right to movement livelihood and life no one can deny that globalization has some positive and negative impact on each of us so thought and discussion on law and justice during the pandemic in different conferences and webinar 
forced us to organize this seminar. Accordingly, I discussed with the faculty advisors of the seminar committee and decided to host this seminar. The researchers and the eminent speakers put their brain and soul in the topic of the seminar and during the discussion and presentation of the papers. Thank to all the participants who presented their paper in the seminar. Some of the paper were well researched and gives us a different perspective about the theme of the seminar. I extend my gratitude to all who were very passionate, affiliated and concerned for the seminar. Some of the good papers will be published in the form of an edi edited book. Thanks, uh, thanks to the keynote speaker and the session chairs of East Technical Sessions who were so enthusiastic discussing the issues and problems related to law and justice during the presentation and uh, inaugural sessions. I'm thankful to each one of you for your intellectual contribution to this seminar. I'm thankful to the chief guest of the variety session, Professor K. V. S. Sharma, guest of honor, Professor Nusrat Praveen Khan for gracing the occasion. I'm thankful to Professor T. S. N. Sastri, founding Vice Chancellor Sikkim National University, Yantok, for his word of wisdom in inaugural session. Thank you, one and all. Now here, I also want to mention that reports of the technical sessions, we know always read before the validity address, but due to some reasons, the reports of technical sessions of the seminar will be read in the end of the program. Sorry for this inconvenience. Once again, thank you, one and all. Over to Ketan. Thank you, sir, for your guiding words. Without any further delay, I would like to invite the Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to grace the valedictory ceremony by saying a few words. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Very good afternoon, Professor K. S. Sarmaji, Professor Nuzat Praveen Khan, Dr. Visharakshi, Dr. Gautam, members of the seminar committee, Ketan, and delegates. We were discussing about the justice under the Indian constitution during the period of COVID-19 and globalization. And yesterday we discussed that for providing justice, we need law. So there is a law, fundamental law, the constitution of India, it provides for socio-economic justice, social justice, or distributive justice. Directive principles of state policy are there. They are to be implemented by the government. Fundamental rights are there. Under Article 15, 16, for example, we have reservation policy. Now, for the implementation of all these principles of justice, we have law, constitution, and other laws. Secondly, we have institutions also. Say, for example, Indian judiciary. So for providing justice, we need territory, we need government, we need institutions, we need rules. So domestic justice or distributive justice is possible within the confines of Republic of India. But when we talk about justice at the global level, then there are certain problems. Because for providing justice, there should be law. Rules and regulations must be there. So we have 15, Article 15, 16, Director of the State Policy. We have institutions also, Supreme Court and High Court. And when we talk about global justice, the first issue is, do wealthy or you can say developed nations have any duty to provide assistance to less developed or developing countries? Now for that, we can say that the universal moral equality of all individuals is a principle. And that means one person, one value. One person, one value, or uh, you know, Dr. Ambedkar said about it, one person, one vote. It is possible here in India through constitution and through judicial. How it can be possible when we talk about 
the implementation of global justice. And by global justice, we mean distributive justice, socioeconomic justice, or social justice, you can say. So is it possible? Can it be done? Now, what is justice? According to Rawls, if inequalities are so fashioned that the least advantaged groups are benefiting, they go to their advantage. So we can say justice is there. Now it is possible in domestic justice, that is true. But when we apply it to global justice, Rawls had written uh, you know, a theory of justice, and then after that, he had written laws of nations. Now, for that, laws of people. Now, whether these principles of distributive justice, which are to be applied within the bounds of the country, can be made applicable at the global level? Because here, for example, reservation. Now, wealth, resources, income, honor, Dignity, these are the social goods, they are to be distributed among all because one person, one value. Is it possible to apply it at the international level, global level? That is, that the hiatus or gap between the developed countries and the developing countries can be bridged through the mechanism of justice. And for justice, we need law. And we, we discussed it yesterday, that laws of, uh, that is rules and regulations of WTO, IMF, World Bank, and our institutions are to be rationalized. And now we will not go into that point again. Now, Rawls says that this principle, which I just mentioned, is a difference principle. Now, whether this can be applied at the national, at the international level or not. Now, here we see a conflict between domestic justice here, which is possible because of territory, because of defined population, because of the duty or obligation towards the people, that is the duty of the government. We have constitution, we have laws, we have decisions of uh, the court. And if a decision is given by the court, that can be implemented. Contempt of court is there. Rules are also binding. But at the international level, international law is a weak law. Some uh, would still argue that the international law is no law. And what about UNO and other agencies, whether the decisions taken at the uh, international level can be implemented? Because for that, sometimes you need force or caution. Is it possible that distributive justice can be implemented through various instruments of uh, uh, global authorities? So do we need a world government? Because here we have a government and we have adjudicatory bodies also, the courts. So how this problem of providing justice to weaker uh, sections of the society like that, developing countries, least developed countries can be given. So one way of looking at it is, as uh, Thomas Pop says, that the principles of distributive justice should be applied at the global level also, in global justice also, no distinction. But <clears throat> there is contrary view also that yes, we can use it. We can provide, because justice means, distributive justice means a sharing of resources with the, what you may call unfortunate or underprivileged masses. That is possible, but it is not an obligation. It is not an obligation. It is a duty of charity. It is a duty of humanity. So if, for example, certain posts are reserved for certain classes in India, it is not charity. It is the obligation of the government. So at the global level, there are some people who argue that yes, if there is a famine, drought, or some natural or man-made disaster in Africa or in other countries, then yes, so we must provide uh, assistance to them. We can do uh, whatever they want us to do. But that is not justice. That is not our obligation. We are doing it by way of uh, charity or by way of, uh, you can say that the call of humanity. This particular view is known as a nationalist view. That is, we have obligation towards the people who are living in my country 
for our country. We have only some concerns for other people also, but that is not because of justice. That is because of charity or humanity. Now, when we are caught in this dilemma that uh, whether we define justice in the same way as we define justice in the domestic confines, because for justice, uh, you need territory, population, government, and uh, then institutions like that. And all these things are missing there uh, at the global level. So how can we uh, resolve the conflict? How can we resolve that dilemma? So for that, we can have three contexts in which the issues of global justice arise. Why, Why to provide justice? First is looking uh, into the past history. That is, you know about that, the most of the developing countries, uh, whole of Africa, I can say, uh, South America, known as Latin America, and uh, Asia also, uh, excluding Middle East and uh, China, almost uh, more than half of the world was colonized. These were the colonies of Britain, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal. So, we will look at the, at the issue of justice from the angle of past, that is compensatory justice. Sometimes we call uh, this uh, reservation policy also as reverse discrimination or compensatory justice. So one way of looking at this issue is looking in the past, and we say that we have a duty to provide uh, them succor because they were colonized by us, so we must do when well, it may be repentance or something else, whatever uh, it is called. But yes, compensatory justice is to be there and it is backward looking. Second, can be looking at the present uh, uh, times. In the present times, uh, there can be looking at past, it is compensatory justice or reverse discrimination, you can call it transactional justice. Transactional justice here means justice in trade. So uh, we should avoid protectionism, we should uh, avoid dumping, we should have uh, loan terms, all these things which are being managed by WTO, IMF, and the World Bank, they are to be rationalized. So we are looking at present. So past is there, present is there, that whatever has happened in past, let us forget. Now let us uh, reform all these rules and regulations, institutions, uh, which are uh, regulating the transactions, the business transactions, justice in trade. There should be justice in trade also. So it's dumping and all these uh, things should be avoided. This is uh, the second thing. But business uh, does not require justice. It is a mutual exchange between A and B. Why do you bring the justice in business? That is the argument. The third is that we look towards the future. When we look towards the future, uh, future, then we cannot forget the past. We cannot uh, ignore present. We have to have a mix of past and present, compensatory also, and then transactional also. And, and then what can be the way out? That is federal kind of justice. What is federal kind of justice? Look at India. Now you find there are certain states which have been given some privileges. You must have read in the constitution that uh, in jobs, some uh, kind of reservation can be made. You must have heard about Haryana, 75% reservation. In Himachal, it is already there. In Northeast uh, countries, uh, oh sorry, Northeastern states, uh, there are certain relaxation and exemptions and reservations also for them. So at the uh, global level, we can have a federal kind of justice where the justice is not like an obligation, but justice is like a mutual cooperation and understanding. As we call it cooperative federalism, so there can be cooperative justice also. It's not that the uh, writ is issued uh, to the uh, entity and that it is to be complied with. That is not possible. So we can have federal kind of justice, that is the emerging view, because we are talking about emerging issues. So the emerging view is that we should have coordination, cooperation, as we have in federation, because almost all the federations are based on cooperative federalism. So we can have uh, like that. 
so these are <laughs> some of my views though i am not uh, i mean specialist in this uh, uh, particular theme but the one thing i know that this theme can be interpreted in many ways and this is the beauty of the theme okay thank you very much thank you sir for your guiding words and after this i would like to invite manas divedi member of seminar committee to brief us with the highlights of two day national seminar over to you manas thank you ketan i will now be presenting the highlights of the event we have organized a two day national seminar on emerging issues in law and justice in the perspective of globalization globalization is the term used to refer to the process of growing interdependence of the world cultures population and most importantly economies globalization has shrunk the world into a global village meaning and dynamics of globalization have evolved over the years the covid-19 pandemic has shown the importance of the evolving ideas of justice and also the continuous need to critically examine them lockdown and other restrictions were imposed in the name of public health and right to health became elusive for the have nots of the world in fact even today adequate vaccination remains inaccessible to the large populations of the world as global decision makers debate on intellectual property rights of the few or health for all similarly right to education continues to be impaired for learners across the world because of lack of access to digital tools and materials thereby limiting their ability to engage with the world the seminar committee has received around 60 abstracts and has received 21 papers we have kept an open seminar allowing the participants to present their abstract all the abstracts were divided into four technical sessions on the basis of their theme the theme of the first technical session was protecting the right to health issues and challenges and the session was chaired by dr sudarshan verma she is a professor at school of legal studies at bba university lucknow the session was co-chaired by dr abhishek tiwari who is an associate professor at university of lucknow the theme of the second technical session was human rights in global world issues and challenges this session was chaired by dr v vislakshi who is the head of the department of department of legal studies at national law university lucknow and this session was co-chaired by dr kalash jinger who is an associate professor at national law university assam the theme of the third technical session was education accessibility and the impact of pandemic and this session was chaired by dr sanjay singh who is the professor of sociology at national law university lucknow this session was co-chaired by dr naseem ahmed who is the head of the department at department of law at integral university lucknow now coming to the fourth technical session the theme of the four technical session was universalism and global governance this last session was chaired by dr atul kumar tiwari who is an associate professor at national law university lucknow and this session was co-chaired by dr prem chand who is an assistant professor at national law university delhi all the participants will be awarded the certificate of participation thank you over to you ketan Thank you, Manas, for these brief highlights. Now, I would like to call upon our chief guest for the event, Professor K V S Sharma, to enlighten us all with his words of wisdom. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. You are audible. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I am thankful to Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Subir K Batnagar for inviting me. to this particular uh, seminar and uh, to address this august gathering i am also thankful to dr prem kumar uh, gautam convener national seminar rmnlu lucknow for conducting this i am congratulating and i am also thankful to him for inviting me to this particular seminar uh, respected uh, professor nuzhat parvin khan is also a, uh, a co speaker with me uh good evening madam and my dear students uh, the today's topic is emerging uh, emerging issues in law and justice in the perspective of globalization 
if we go through our family laws, we have Hindu law, Muslim law, Christian law, Parsi law, all this. In family law, even today, we are studying what are the sources of law uncodified. What are the sources? Vedas, Vedangas, Upanishads, Puranas, all these are sources. And if you see, according to our, uh, these Vedas and Puranas, our period is divided into four types. Krutayug, Tretayug, Dvaparyug, and Kaliyug. If you see Krutayug and Tretayug, that is Rama period, Supreme Court also accepted that Rama was born in a particular place, and they also accepted that uh, Dasrada and uh, 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 that Ayodhya city was the capital of a particular Rama Raja, and all these with evidence they proved. In those days, Dasarath Maharaj, if you see Puranas, he lived for lakhs of years. He went to other planets to fight, uh, to, to help angels. And later on, when we come down to what we call uh, Treta Yuk, Rama's life is reduced to 1,25,000 years lifespan. In those days also, Rishis used to go, go to other planets and uh, they were uh, what you call exchanging their views and other things with uh, the persons who are staying in other planets. If we come to Dvapara Yug, if you see in Mahabharata, Arjun, we have to accept Mahabharata happened and Dwarka is there in ocean. Our archaeologists also showed that in YouTube also we are seeing all these. In Dwapara Yug also, people, the, the, they used to go to, sages used, the, they used to go to other planets and uh, they used to exchange their views, cultural, economic and everything. Now, when it come to Kali Yug, those days, in case they discussed, they should have discussed emerging issues in law and justice in universalization of, universalization they have to. Now we lost all those powers, extraordinary powers as a human being. So we are limited to our globe only. So we are discussing emerging issues in law and justice in the perspective of globalization. This globalization is also not, it is not a new concept. Even 5,000 years back also, we have Nalanda University. People from China, other countries, they used to come here and they used to study. People from other countries, they used to come here and they used to do business, we used to go. So in those days also, 5,000 years back also, this globalization was there. It is not a new concept. But after uh, what you call getting independence, last two, three hundred years, laws were not there regulating this, what you call either commerce or what you call this family matters, all these. And again, this globalization is increasing. Laws are not so effective. We are trying to, what you call, pass laws with reference to globalization. So with reference to globalization, what are the legal issues involved? In case legal issues are involved, how we can do justice to the, what you call, aggrieved party? According to Solomon, justice means to give every man his due. And globalization is the process of interaction and integration among people, companies, and governments worldwide. This increase in global interactions has caused a growth in international trade and exchange of ideas, beliefs, and culture. Globalization is primarily an economic process of interaction and integration that is associated with social and cultural aspects. However, disputes and diplomacy are also large parts of history of globalization and of modern globalization. Then economic globalization. Economic globalization is the increasing economic interdependence of national economies across the world through a rapid increase in cross-border movement of goods, services, technology, and capital. Then next come cultural globalization. Cultural globalization refers to the transmission of ideas, meanings, and values around the world in such a way as to extend and intensify social relations. This process is marked by the common consumption of cultures that have been diffused by the internet popular culture, media, and international travel. Then political globalization. Political globalization refers to the growth of the worldwide political system 
both in size and complexity. That system includes national governments, their governmental and intergovernmental organizations, as well as government independent elements of global civil society, such as international non-governmental organization and social movement organizations. Now, movement of people, an essential aspect of globalization is movement of people and state boundary limits on the movement have changed across history. Then global justice and inequality. What is global justice? The global justice movement is the loose collection of individuals and groups often referred to as movement of movements who advocate fair trade rules and perceive current institutions of economic integration as problems. Then social inequality. The economies of the world have, level, have developed unevenly historically such that entire geographical regions were left mirrored in poverty and disease, while others began to reduce poverty and disease on a wholesale basis. Then anti-global governance. Beginning in the 1930s, opposition arose to the idea of a world government as advocated by the organizations such as the world federalist movements. Those who oppose global governance typically do so on objections that the idea is unfeasible, inevitably oppressive, or simply unnecessary. Then environment, environmentalist opposition. Environmentalist concerns with globalization include issues such as global warming, global water supply, and global crisis, inequality in energy consumption and energy conservation, transnational air pollution, and pollution of the world ocean, overpopulation, overpopulation, world habitat, sustainability, deforestation, biodiversity loss, and species extinction. One critic of globalization is that natural resources of the poor have systematically taken over by the rich and pollution promulgated by the rich is systematically dumped on the poor. By transforming borders and deterritorializing behavior, globalization raises a host of questions and concerns fundamental to law. Many commentators argue that international and national law are no longer adequate categories for the totality of law today and offer an array of new concepts such as transnational law, global law, global legal pluralism, etc., to help us understand law in the global space. Then transnational applicability and enforceability of law with reference to this point, I will explain at the end. The impact of globalization is being viewed positive or negative depending upon the social, political, and economic realities of the various countries of the world, whether categorized as developed or developing nations. Then what are the benefits of globalization? Access to new markets, product development and new revenue streams, sharing knowledge, technology, and culture, developing universal standards, access to diverse talent people, a diversified workforce, and workplace culture. Then what are the challenges of, global, of globalization? Worker exploitation, job loss, high investment, environmental degradation, taxes across borders, legal complaints for employees. With reference to these aspects, so many issues are there, legal issues. For that, till 1990s, our uh, in 1960s, my teachers, my process, they did not study labor law, company law, all this. But later on, slowly they introduced these laws. But these laws are not so effective to deal with international transactions. We have IPR, domestic IPR only, company law, domestic IPR. If you take environment, domestic. But in 1990s, we have disputes. They, we have Arbitration Act 1940. That was domestic. But in 1990s, this United Nations Assembly, it said, we pass model laws for all subjects. And you have to pass similar law by making necessary changes in your country. So our IPR, now international IPR we are teaching, labor laws, international labor law we are teaching. For example, arbitration, international commercial arbitration we are teaching. At one time, even today, several national law schools, several universities, they don't have private international law. In some schools, so traditional state universities, they removed public international law as if it is unnecessary. But now, without studying international law, public international law, without studying private international law, we, it is difficult for what you call students 
or professional to survive in this world. So one must concentrate now public international area, international aspects also because of this globalization. So many legal issues will be there. And we have IPR, international IPR, everything we are teaching international than domestic. So, with, for example, domestic, our, what you call marriages, everything, International Marriages Act they passed. With reference to what you call divorce also, International Marriages Act is there with reference to our cultural aspects also. Uh, private international is already there. And this international aspects of all these aspects already we introduced. So there is no worry with reference to this legal issues in what you call uh, globalization. Surely we are ready to tackle any problem if it arises. Already the system is in place. Thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for guiding us, sir. We are glad to have been able to host you. Now, I would like to take this golden opportunity to invite our guest of honor, Dr. Nuzat Praveen Khan, to say a few guiding words. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you are muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Sorry. No problem, ma'am. Thank you, Ketan, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ram Manohar, National Law University, Lucknow, Professor Subir Kumar Bhatnagarji, Professor KBS Sharma, Honorable Vice Chancellor, NLU Aurangabad, Dr. Prem Kumar Gautam, Convener, National Seminar uh, of, uh, you know, on a very relevant topic, all the faculty members of Ram Manohar Loya National Law University, my dear students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. So first of all, I would, I'm really happy to see this important topic which the university have chosen for this national seminar, Emerging Issues in Law and Justice in the Perspective of Globalization. And uh, I'm also honored that I've been invited by the university, by the Honorable Vice Chancellor to be a part of this seminar. So while we are talking about uh, emerging issues, uh, especially in the context of globalization. So globalization today seems to have an impact on the delivery of justice in the countries across the world. Uh, it actually globalization integrates and disseminates legal development and the debates uh, that are taking place uh, across the world. Uh, in fact, it is from one region to the another region of the world. It is all affecting each other. Uh, development of laws and concepts which are relating to human rights, competition law, intellectual property rights, cyber laws, media laws, uh, I'll say artificial intelligence, and many other such areas. In the recent past, these are the best examples with regard to globalization and how these are the areas which are, you know, um, emerging issues in the context of law and justice. Uh, globalization has an impact uh, how these laws have developed in many countries around the world. Uh, how the provisions of the laws were enacted in one country and how that influence uh, to the laws which are already there or are in the process in another country of the world. And this is due to the simple reality that globalization has linked the economies of the countries that formerly had no territorial or physical ties. Uh, and and that, that has further become stronger, first of all, uh, you know, uh, technology, globalization, and then this COVID. So all this have, uh, you know, made the whole situation more strong. The states were earlier or primarily responsible for delivering justice. And the international dimension of justice was generally overlooked. However, due to a renaissance of interest in the normative political philosophy, the strengthening of the globalization and a movement in how global politics is viewed away from the state-centric approach, there is a growing interest in the international element of justice in the modern times. There is an understanding that in today's interconnected and globalized society, problems and solutions must also be global. International justice can be found in the Western tradition of natural laws, which is a system of rights or justice that is common to all human beings. 
uh, and it is derived from the nature rather than the social laws. Uh, I just want to quote uh, W. Friedman, who said, the history of natural laws is a tale of search of mankind for absolute justice and its failures. Uh, there are many Greek thoughts that we have a moral relationship with individuals outside of our state and that they are the world citizens. In India, we have a concept of Vasudeva Kutumkam, which also means the world is one family. It, it is an Indian tradition that promotes global justice and cooperation. Indian thinkers have also emphasized on the importance of spiritual dimension of justice, which emphasize the value of individuals all over the world. So, uh, I mean, if I, I'll take actually five. Uh, while uh, you know, discussing the topic, I want to take five different dimensions with regard to emerging issues in the context of law and justice. So firstly, I'd like to talk about encouraging foreign investment. So bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements are, we know, are being commonly used in the context of attracting foreign investment to protect the rights of the companies that invest in other countries. And these treaties impose responsibilities on host government to provide fair and equitable treatment to foreign investors, as well as favorable tax and regulatory scheme and protection against unlawful exploitation. Uh, then another important aspect is reliance on foreign precedents. Uh, there are many socioeconomic aspects of globalizations that are constantly reshaping the operation of our judicial system in certain type of appellant litigation and adjudication. For example, when a reliance is placed on a foreign president, it is required that the actual location of the parties in different jurisdictions, which makes it necessary to mention and debate foreign statutes and the judgments, in litigation, which are involving cross-border business activities, and of course, family-related issues. Uh, Honorable Justice uh, Sarma already talked about importance of private international law and conflict of law. For example, when local courts are now being asked to deal with international legal documents in the areas of conflict law of laws, especially if it is related to you know, family law or a business law situation. Uh, there are, you know, matters where there are proper jurisdiction and choice of law, as well as the recognition and enforcement of foreign decrees and the arbitral awards. Furthermore, uh, there are, uh, you know, respective countries uh, who are the parties in international instrument, uh, some of the international treaties, conventions, declarations, that, and that situation, domestic courts are actually compelled to investigate the text and the interpretation of those documents. Uh, there is always a room for argument when it comes to citing international precedent in the circumstances where local laws may not be providing enough advice or support. Uh, okay, so these are the two aspects. The third aspect I want to talk about is constitutional transplantation. How constitution of one country is having or helping the other country to, to, to develop, to grow their constitution. So we know several countries, even, even when we talk of our constitution, we say that uh, you know, our constitution makers have taken different things from different constitutions of the world. So several countries' constitutional system, particularly those with, which are having some common backgrounds, they have habitually borrowed ideas and the court decisions from one another. Decolonization took place in most part of the Asian and Africa during the early years of the United Nations organizations. And during that time, many new constitution added clause that were mutually similar, which are based on the principle, which are found in the international instrument, such as the United Nations Charter on the uh, um, you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UDHR. Then another very important convention is European Convention on the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, which was enacted in 1953, and it became a source of doctrinal borrowing for legal and constitutional systems. Then International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on you know, Economic, uh, Social and Cultural Rights, they have a reference point for such constitutional borrowing, even in the recent years. Many of the features of the United States Constitution 
they've been exported through international instruments, be it uh, Bill of Rights or judicial review, uh, or the limits on the governmental power or equal protection, etc. So expanding the scope of international human rights standard and the importance of international institutions, dealing with the issues of you know, trade, liberalization, climate change, war crimes, law of the sea, cross-border investment are, uh, you know, these are some of the uh, one which we can talk about. Uh, because of the advancement of information technology and communication technology, nowadays it has become, uh, you know, to obtain foreign legal material has become considerably easier. Uh, you know, if we look up time back to maybe 30 years, uh, 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 subscriptions to foreign law report and the legal reviews were very expensive, prohibitively expensive, and which was putting most of the judges and the practitioners and the educational institutions out of the reach of this. I don't think today's these younger one can understand how much difficult was it to get any foreign resource or any, because today for them, it is just a click away. So this digital revolution, uh, has drastically altered the situation. Most of the constitutional court judgments are today posted on the publicly available websites, allowing for simple access from anywhere in the world. Uh, then commercial online database, which is also made possible for judges, practitioners, and law students all around the world to easily access any information from a variety of jurisdictions. The fourth point which I want to discuss here is with regard to non-traditional threats to human security. Uh, we know about the traditional threats to the human security and those traditional dangers which come from enemies, military, which can jeopardize the state sovereignty and territorial integrity. However, uh, when we talk of you know, non-traditional justice in a global context and the threats which have been included, these are non-military dangers to the human security. They can affect any country and they can they include climate change, energy issues, food and water security, to, to name a few. And these risks are transnational in nature, meaning that they have an impact that extends beyond the border of a single country. Furthermore, they complement one another and can be combined to create a greater difficulty. For example, millions of people around the world suffered from food insecurity, water scarcity. As a result, given the global dimension of the problem, government all over the world must work together to combat non-traditional security concern. Climate change we know is such a hazard that poses severe threat to humanity survival increased greenhouse gas emissions. They cause range of difficulties to an environmental dangers around the world, which can be, you know, uh, flooding, uh, sea level rise, environmental degradation, etc. So coming to the last point, and which is very important, and uh, the one which actually I was planning to speak only on is role of artificial intelligence in the context of law and justice. We know that uh, development and implementation of AI, artificial intelligence, have been the subject of much debate during the last debate. In India, for example, Niti Aayog has recently released an approach paper on the need of, to use AI, but to be used very responsibly and ethically. Indian judiciary has already taken a quantum leap in the last two years to fully grasp the possibilities that cutting edge Inform, uh, artificial intelligence technology has to offer. Uh, having established the basis of e-court, uh, which you can say e-court mission mode project, uh, former Chief Justice of India, Honorable Justice Bob Day, uh, has consistently emphasized the need to use uh, artificial intelligence driving technology to increase uh, institutional efficiency. In fact, uh, while he was a Chief Justice on the Constitution Day, he unveiled the beta edition of Subhas, a neural translation tool, tool that introduced AI into the Indian courts. Uh, Justice Nageshwar Rao, who chairs the Supreme Court AI Committee, claims that AI would be implied for administrative purposes. Actually, it has already been uh, used for being used for administrative purposes and to speed up the justice process. Uh, we are talking about uh, AI to be incorporated into legal system 
um, it has already been planned and implemented in some areas uh, with the goal of increasing the uh, you know efficiency of the justice system institutional efficiency uh, however still it is an in infancy it is being applied in various aspects uh, around the world so just to talk uh, very quickly about the world situation how ai is being used in the united kingdom uh, ai is used to predict reoffending criminals uh, Estonia, it is used to adjudicate a small claim uh, through robot judges in China, Russia, Mexico. Uh, it is used, being used to provide legal advice and approve the pensions of the pensioners. In Malaysia, it is used to support sentencing decisions. In Austria, it is a sophisticated document management system. Uh, in Colombia, Argentina, it is being used to identify urgent cases and in Singapore to transcribe court hearing in real time. So, of course, these are the avenues whereby India can also use it and right now we are in fact using it in certain uh, aspect. So to improve and this will be very, very beneficial to improve administrative efficiency, task specific uh, work narrowly tailored, you know, tailored algorithm, which is trained through machine learning, can be used to automate common administrative processes, such as scheduling hearing and preparing cause list, as well as more complicated tasks such as discovery and document review. Uh, intervention at the level of smart e-filing, intelligent uh, filtering, prioritization of cases, or notifications and case monitorings are some of the procedural tasks that can be benefited from the usage of AI. I think that today's generation can understand much better and they must be actually understanding the actual use of it. So AI, when built and used for intelligent analytics and research work to supplement human decision making. Additionally, computational technology can be utilized to speed up the delivery of justice in cases such as, you know, traffic challenge, motor vehicle compensation claims before potentially developing more complicated, you know, algorithmic decision making tools, assimilated learning from such first generational technologies that can boost the administrative efficiency would be required. So finally, I will just, uh, you know, conclude to say that uh, it, uh, AI through interactive interfaces and dynamic libraries, legal robots can be applied cross sectors such as insurance, banking, etc. And uh, these challenges include concern about transparency and explain the ability of AI potential data and design biases, which might perpetuate social inequalities and the need to preserve human judgment and autonomy of the judges. Here, the debate goes to another dimension. If we talk of jury metrics, et cetera, so that will take another uh, lecture's time, which we don't have right now. So, uh, I mean, while I talked about uh, use of artificial intelligence or, uh, you know, threats, different type of threats, be it climatic. So uh, for all this from, this, uh, you know, different countries, uh, uh, legal system can learn a lot from each other, both in terms of institutional architecture, as well as uh, with the growth of substantive laws, especially with increased cross-border commerce and investment, it is critical that we all engage appropriately in multilateral rulemaking and dispute resolution. Judges, lawyers, professors, and even law students from various nations have a lot of possibilities today to communicate, to collaborate, and to learn from each other experience in this age of globalization and the technology driven world. With these words, I'm ending. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am, for your guiding words. Moving ahead, I would now like to invite Anushka Srivastav to deliver insights and report of the four technical sessions. Over to you, Anushka. Thank you, Ketan. Good evening to Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and all the dignitaries present in this valedictory ceremony. I will present the proceedings of the two days national seminar held on the key theme of emerging issues and in law and justice in the perspective of globalization. The inaugural ceremony of the national seminar began with the address of the vice chancellor of Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia, National Law University. He spoke about globalization and its 
its effect on India. It was followed by the address of Dr. V. Vizalakshi, head of department, RMMLU, who elaborated on her research paper on the issue of business and human rights in the era of globalization. The session moved on with the address of Professor T. S. N. Sastri, Honorable Vice Chancellor, NLU Sikkim. He firstly talked about the conjunction of law and justice and globalization, furthering on to the perspectives of globalization. It was then followed by introduction of the themes by the chairperson of the seminar committee, Dr. Prem Kumar Gautam. The session was concluded by the vote of thanks by the co-convener of the organizing committee, Mr. Atre Tripathi. The first technical session was chaired by Professor Sudarshan Verma and co-chaired by Dr. Abhishek Kumar Tiwari. In this session, nine research papers were presented virtually by eminent scholars. They centered around issues and challenges in protecting the right to health. Most of the presenters address the urgent issue of COVID-19 pandemic issues. Uh, some papers highlighted the importance of health infrastructure, vaccination for COVID-19, and, uh, and the lack of medical facilities in remote areas and the negative consequences of COVID-19, like social isolation. One paper explained why vaccination is essential for us, even though there is a freedom of choice. Presenters also suggested policy measures to fight such a global situation in the near future. Furthermore, some presenters believe that climate change is multifaceted and to know its magnitude and impact, empirical studies should be conducted. On the other hand, some explained the issues of climate justice, its classification and stressed on the sustainable development of the society and the environment. They highlighted the importance of international conventions on climate change, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and several conferences on climate change and right to health. One of the paper presenters spoke about the reproductive and sexual health rights and the importance of a well-developed public health system for, for providing healthcare facilities that are comprehensive and accessible to all. The second session was chaired by Dr. V. Vizalakshi and co-chaired by Dr. Kailash Jingal. This session focused on the contemporary issues and challenges to human rights across the globe. The first paper discussed the state of virtual curfew in India, which was a study of socio-economic ramification of internet shutdowns with an emphasis on part three of Indian constitution, censorship policy, and section 144 of the CRPC. The second paper was presented on the issue of freedom of speech and expression and the validity of sedition in India. The subsequent paper was presented on the privacy rights vis-a-vis -vis forensic methods in Indian criminal justice system. They discussed the DNA paternity tests and section 112 of the Indian Evidence Act. The fourth paper was authored on the subject of international instruments and constitutional law on torture, which explored solutions for custodial violence and illegal arrests with an emphasis on the numerous conventions and treaties on torture along with Article 21 of the Constitution of India. The next paper deliberated on the issues and challenges to cybercrime and laws in India with a stress on cyber terrorism and cyber appellate tribunal and also suggested several measures to curb cyber crimes. The sixth paper was a study on the Indian perspective of globalization and human rights. It discussed globalization in the arena of education, health, environment, and rights of tribal people and laborers in the developed and developing countries. The seventh paper discussed the various facets of violence against women during COVID-19, which has emerged as a global issue, and also proposed various social programs to be conducted to eradicate this problem. The next paper discussed the human rights of migrant workers, challenges of the new decade. The paper highlighted the implications of this problem on a global level. The ninth paper was titled Bully by App and the Imminent Need to Ensure Dignity of Women in the Cyberspace. The paper offered a constitutional outlook in the cyber law space. The final paper of this technical session was on economic regulation in India post-liberalization era, which discussed relevant laws passed at central and state level 
on economic regulation and the present position. The third technical session was chaired by Professor Dr. Sanjay Singh and co-chaired by Dr. Naseem Ahmed. This session revolved around education accessibility and the impact of pandemic. The first paper of the session was on right to education, assessing a decade of reform and the way forward for India, where they focused on challenges and achievements of the Right to Education Act, which made primary school available in rural areas. The second paper highlighted the disparate impact of COVID-19 inequality in learning opportunities, where they focused on a survey conducted in some parts of Delhi and Uttar Pradesh, where they found that people are not able to learn effectively. They recommended that attention is required and there is a need to strengthen the education system and to encounter social and economic disparity. The following paper was titled Demystifying the Meritocracy Arguments in Higher Education, a way forward to reaffirm social justice in the era of globalization, where they focused on education policy and socioeconomic background of, candidate, of candidates as various factors are responsible for the overall development of personality. The fourth paper was a critical analysis of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and right to education and related education to fundamental rights and human rights and focused on the 86th amendment to the constitution of india the next paper was presented on the role of supreme court of india and respective high courts through their innovative judgments regarding the protection and welfare of children which focused on the philosophical aspect of the need of education the sixth paper was on the issues and challenges to the right to education in the times of the pandemic. The paper stressed that the barriers of teaching should be struck down. The next paper further elucidated this point and analyzed that access to internet is a part of right to education. They focused on various international instruments such as UDHR and ICCPR where internet access has been constituted as a human right. The eighth paper of the session explained the contemporary issues and challenges to right to education and relied their study on the NSO report and explained how right to education is important for sustainable development. The ninth paper was on technology necessitated education and the problem of learning poverty, which stressed on problems of learning poverty, which means being unable to read and understand at the primary age of just 10 years, and explained the dichotomy of income poverty and learning poverty. The 10th paper was authored on globalization, culture relativism, and the expression of mental distress, which focused on cultural relativism and global illness, such as depression and suicide, and how mental health has gained recognition throughout the world in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The last paper of the session was on globalization and its impact on Dalit women in India, and the author expressed their own views and suggested solutions for a safer environment for women. The last technical session of the na national seminar was chaired by Dr. A.K. Tiwari and co-chaired by Dr. Premchan. The session was a discourse on universalism and global governance. The first paper was a study about India's race for international recognition in the realm of global governance and discussed the trajectory of the development of a global governance regime through historical geopolitical events such as world wars, cold war and non-aligned movement. The second paper was an exploratory study on globalization farming and land grab. The paper raised the issue that indigenous tribes are, suf are suffering the brunt of aggressive colonization in the garb of economic globalization and a need to balance the economic aspirations of the global corporation with the interest of indigenous tribes. The next paper of the session was titled Tinkered Cooperative Federalism in India Amidst COVID-19, Lessons for Future Governance and Way Forward, which discussed cooperative and collaborative federalism and emphasized the need to harmonize the law to both address the requirement of national secu security as well as protect the freedom of privacy and speech as guaranteed by the law of the land. The fourth paper focused on governance of the outer space 
issues and challenges in the new era and the need to evolve a global dimension to govern the use of the outer space resource taking into consideration the entry of private players and it criticized the lacunae of space laws in india the fifth paper was a critical analysis on separation of power and political accountability it contrasted the doctrine of separate, uh, strict separation of power and checks and balances model and discussed the montesquieu model and madison model the sixth paper which was titled dichotomy between archaic wheel and western genes can it be relatively universal discussed the concept of identity markers and the importance of cultural relativism and asserted the need to sing these competing concepts of cultural relativism and universalism the succeeding paper titled at exorcising the colonial ghost in a geographical south classroom which criticized the west domination on the determination of the trajectory and concepts of international law it further proposed solutions to the problem by focusing the need to incorporate third and the fourth world countries approaches and the indigenous voices the next paper was a study on the role of international financial institutions in promoting development vis-a-vis -vis achieving global justice which pointed out the lack of independence on their part due to dual leadership of states and executive boards it raised the question if such institutions can be considered as democracy democracy deficit as their voting powers are based on their quota share the concluding paper of the session and of the seminar was authored on disclosure of origin requirement and discussed the regulation of biological resources and how misappropriation of the traditional knowledge of indigenous people and the concept of biopiracy thank you over to you ketan thank you anushka for this brief insights i on behalf of seminar committee deliver heartiest congratulations to all the participants for making this event a huge success through your presence now moving towards the fag end of the ceremony i would like to invite the co convener of the seminar committee mr atre tripathi to deliver the vote of thanks over to you atre thank you ketan uh good evening to professor subir bhatnagar honorable vice chancellor dr ram manohar lohia national law university our chief guest professor k v s sharma honorable vice chancellor nlu aurangabad our guest of honor nozat pravin khan dean school of law bennett university greater noida dr v visalakshi head of department and our most valued invited guests ladies and gentlemen i am very humbled and honored to exchange the gratitude on behalf of the organizing committee and on my personal behalf is such a distinguished and intellectually stimulating gathering my sincere gratitude to our vice chancellor professor bhatnagar whose constant support and guidance have made this seminar success my very special thanks to our chief guest professor kv sharma for taking out some valuable time from his busy schedule and present his insightful views on the topic also i take immense pleasure in extending my sincere thanks to our guest of honor professor nozat pravin khan who has graced this auspicious academic gathering with her insightful uh, lecture i extend my heartfelt thanks to learned chairs and co-chairs of all the sessions dr sudarshan verma dr abhishek tiwari dr v v salakshi dr kailash jinger dr naseem ahmed dr atul kumar tiwari and dr prem chand repetitors of the sessions ms ms meenakshi mr wilson mr umang mr mohammad adil who have helped us to accomplish this national seminar in a way which have set a tone for other important academic discussions under the theme the organizing committee recognizes your contribution at last i would like to thank our chairperson dr prem kumar gautam our faculty members dr mitali dr abdullah and ms priya all other committee members for their requisite contributions we hope to conduct more of these seminars as well as other academic uh, discussions with full zeal i am very happy that we have organized this seminar in a hybrid way which is much better from being fully online some of us were in campus which was very enriching enriching experience and i have, i am hopeful that we will be able to organize our events fully offline in due course to conclude let me once again reiterate my gratitude to all also it is a humble request to all the guests and participants that kindly show yourself in videos so that we can have a group photograph thank you
ਸਾਜਣ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਸ਼ਰਮਾ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਮੁਜ਼ਤੀ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਸਰ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ एवरीवन ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਸਰ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਵਾਈਸ ਚਾਂਸਲਰ ਸਰ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਮੈਮ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ एवरीवन ਵੈਰੀ ਵੈਲ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟਸ ਲਾਈਕ ਦਾ ਆਈਡੀਆ ਆਫ ਹੈਵਿੰਗ ਇਟ ਪਾਰਟਲੀ ਆਫਲਾਈਨ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ एवरीवन ਯਸ ਮੈਮ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਮੈਮ ਓਕੇ ਬਾਏ 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 ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਲੀਵ ਨਾਓ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ